All right, so we are starting into this section on the right. I actually began this section at the end of uh, the previous lecture, which I, and uh, there's two sets of slides, uh, even though it's a kind of consistent topic across both of them, one lab and an archive. The lab is the first in a series of four labs uh, where we build up this movies app that I've been talking about. So that begins this week. You actually have enough knowledge at the moment to fully understand uh, what you're doing in this lab, but uh, I hold off on it until the actual labs themselves. So I'm just going to get straight into this set of slides here. But as I said, I began this set of slides last week. So you may need to go back to the previous lecture just to get the kind of overview that I began that I gave at the beginning. Right. Uh, so you just bear with me for a second now. So I'm just going to jump straight into where I left off, which was here. Um, and what we're talking about is this notion of state associated with a component. Uh, a component has two sources of data. One is props, which we know uh, a little bit about. The other source of data for a component is state. And whereas props are passed into a component from the outside, uh, usually by another component. State is uh, internal to a component and it manages uh, the changing of that state variable or variables itself. The critical thing though is if a component changes the value of one of its state variables, then what React will do is it will re-execute or as we say, it re-renders the component. And so if it re-renders or re-executes the component, potentially the component may change what it displays on the screen. Hence, the component is dynamic. In the majority of cases, what would cause a state variable of a component to change is the user interacts with the component in a certain way. So the example that I'm going to talk my way through, uh, I've giving you a kind of a visual representation of the component on the right here. And what I'm saying in this diagram is I have a component and it has a state variable. Sorry now. Um, it has a state variable, which is a simple integer and it's initialized to zero. The component uh, expects a prop, which I've called jump and it's also an integer and it has a button and as we'll see when the user clicks the button that's going to trigger a change in the value of my state variable all i'm going to do actually is i'm going to add whatever prop value was passed in to me add that to my state variable uh, and keep doing that every time the user clicks the, the the button and so my state variable is changing and as i said uh, when the variable changes, what React will do is it will re-execute your component function from beginning to end. Now, uh, the code for this uh, component, I've actually included it in the basic React lab uh, from last week. Um, I'm always nervous. People can hear me, can't they? <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if we go back to the basic React Lab, which is here. And if you go into the sample components, so it's down here at the very, that's not sample components. It's this one here. So if we, I suppose if I just start up Storybook and remind you, uh, of what the component looks like. I've got three stories. Uh, come on, I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. But here is my component. Here's how it renders. Here's my button, and I'm just telling you that the the jump value that was passed into my component for this particular story, its value is two. Okay, that's just for information purposes. So every time I click this button, uh, what's going to happen is this counter here is just going to keep incrementing. Uh, by two, but uh, so, okay, that's the only part that's changing in the component every time I click the button, but still it's sufficient for me to be able to say that this component is dynamic. It's changing what it displays uh, every time the user interacts with it, i.e. clicks the button. So let's uh, look at the code for the component. And so uh, here's the critical line here. This is how we declare a state variable. Uh, so there's a special function called the useState function, and it's something that we import from React. Uh, it takes an argument. The argument is the initial value that you want to give to your state variable. So it looks like this time, in this case, I want to initialize my state variable to the value zero. Now what the function returns is an array and the array has two elements in it. Uh, what I'm actually doing here on the left-hand side of the assignment statement, this is not a, something specific to React now, this is just a JavaScript thing. Uh, I haven't covered it uh, to be honest with you, I'll cover it a little bit later on, but I can just explain what this line is saying. Uh, I know for a fact that the useState function returns an array of two elements the first entry in the array is going to be a reference to my state variable. So it's actually this function creates the state variable. The second element in the array is a function which I can call from within my component if I want to change my state variable uh, value. So because I've passed zero over here, that means count is going to be pointing at an integer. Uh, and its initial value will be zero. Okay, so that entire line declares my state variable. Uh, it gives me a reference to the state variable, and it gives me a function that I can use if I want to change my state variable's value within the component. Uh, I have a console.log, and I'll explain in a second why I put that in, just to prove something. If I look down at the bottom at the JSX, uh, forget about all the stuff down here for now, I'll come back to that in a second. Here's what the component returns. And that's this is kind of consistent with what I showed you uh, in Storybook. So I'm just displaying the current value of count. I'm displaying uh, props.jump. I haven't shown you any stories, but I have told you that this component is going to receive a prop called jump. 
and that's going to be an integer. So I'm just displaying that as well as part of the output of the component. So that's why I was getting, uh, you know, two here, for example. And uh, here's my button. And this is where the user interaction comes in now. So with my button, I've associated a, a click handler, a click handler, I suppose. We, we know what event handlers are. I've mentioned event handlers in the context of the browser. We haven't lost any of that stuff. All of that is still very important to React. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm assigning to the on click event this function, this function being this guy here. So every time the user clicks the button, this function is going to execute. And what does the function do? Lo and behold, it actually uh, changes the value of my state variable. It calls the set count function, which uh, was returned to me by the use state function. And set count is a, it's a, it's a setter method, really. We know what setter methods are from, from Java. That's effectively what set count is. By the way, you can call these things anything you want to. I could have called this, you know, function foo. Uh, there's no prescription as to what you call uh, the function or what you call the variable. But count and set count are just sensible names. So anyway, uh, inside in the event handler associated with clicking the button, I call set count. And all I'm doing is I'm just computing the new value of count. I'm taking the current value and I'm adding jump.pop or sorry, pop.jump to it. Now, here's the, uh, here's the trick though. When you call this set count function, we are changing a state variable. And I said at the outset, if a component changes the value of one of its state variables, then what React will do is it will completely execute the, uh, the component all over again. So it re-executes all of this all over again. Now, of course, that means that say I click the button once. And so now uh, my, and I'm assuming props that jump has a value of two. So now my uh, counter is going to have the value two. Um, what's kind of interesting is the use state function, when it get ex gets executed the second time, it actually ignores what you're passing to it because it now knows that the new value of count is going to be two. It's not going to reset it back to zero. So this is now going to have the value two in it, or it's going to be pointing at, sorry, it's not going to have the value two. The count is going to be pointing at a variable which is going to have the value two in it. The setter is going to be the exact same. Uh, the user clicks the button again, let's say. Now count is going to have, uh, I'm going to compute four here. Uh, but I've changed the state variable again. So React will execute my component all over again. That means the use state function is going to execute again. This time it's going to return an array, an array where the count is now going to be pointing at a memory location that's going to have the value four in it. This is still going to be pointing at the same uh, setter function. It's, it's actually the use state. Use state creates this function for you. You don't have to do it. You are using it down here, but you don't have to create it. So, there's something interesting going on behind the scenes in this use state hook, sorry, this use state function. Uh, by that, I mean the very first time this component renders, it's, it seems that the use state function knows that it should use its parameter value to initialize the state variable. But on all subsequent uh, executions of this component, as in when the user keeps clicking the button, the use state function seems to realize, well, this is not the first time I have been invoked. So I'm going to ignore the parameter that was passed to me. Uh, and I'm going to return a reference to the updated count. 
Uh, you don't really need to worry about how does it know whether it's been invoked the first time or subsequently. You don't need to worry about that. There's some obviously some interesting implementation going on behind the scenes. All you're concerned with is you use the use state to declare your state variable. You pass it a parameter which declares the initial value for that state variable. And the use state returns a two entry array where the first entry is going to be a reference to a memory location that's going to contain the current value of your state variable. And the second entry in the array is going to be a function which you can use to update the value of the state variable. Um, so I said, at every time this line of code executes, my component completely re-renders or re-executes. That's what React will do for you. And I can prove that to you by virtue of this console.log here. Uh, so if I opened up in the, the um, developer tools, and I'll just do a refresh, maybe just to clean things up. It's refreshed itself actually, um, that's okay. So if you observe what's happening down here, so as I keep clicking, so this is coming from the console.log. Again, if I just uh, do a refresh, this, this is output to the console because my component has rendered for the first time. And what did we want the console to output? We wanted the console to output. Uh, okay, the current value of count and the value of prop, which is simple enough. So jump is my prop and the initial value is zero. And then as I keep clicking, So the console.log is executing every single time. And that's kind of proving to us that when we change a state variable, React will re-execute your component from beginning to end. Are there any questions about that, I wonder? This is a fundamental part of React now that you need to understand. There's not a whole lot to it when you look at it in a small component like this, but when you build up to a larger app, where you may have a lot of state variables around the place. The principles are the same, but it becomes a little bit more difficult to follow the execution flow, I guess. Any questions? No? Okay. So we have this use state function. Um, it declares a state variable. Uh, and it returns a setter, as I said, or a mutator, it's also called. Uh, there's, a, there's a technical term for the use state function. It's referred to as a React hook. And later on, there are uh, other React hook functions that we look at. So, so these hook functions are uh, a pretty important part of the fundamentals of how React actually works. Now, just to go back to um, the code, uh, I, I did mention at the end of last week's uh, second lecture that there were one or two aspects of props that we hadn't covered uh, up to then. One is if you want to, uh, if you want to declare a default value for a prop, just in case your component is executed and there's no particular value provided for a prop, uh, but within your component, do you want to give a default value in that case? Well, this is how you actually do it. The coding is quite clumsy, but um, so counter here is my component that I've declared. So you go counter dot default props, and then you can list the default values that you want to have for your various props. Here, um, what we're doing here is we're kind of safeguarding against the possibility that somebody tries to pass a prop into my component uh, 
where the prop that they're passing in its value is inconsistent with what the type of value should be. So this component expects a, an integer prop, uh, which I've called jump. So it does have to be an integer. And if it isn't, then I'd like my component maybe just to throw uh, some sort of warning message back to the developer telling them you're using the, the component in, uh, incorrectly. So again, the, the syntax isn't great, but the net effect of this piece of code here is to say that my jump prop, its type should be number. Okay, um, what I'm actually using in this line here is I'm using a separate library called the props type library. Now, to be honest, I don't use it that much in the rest of this uh, section of the module but it's there anyway. I'm just making you aware of it. What I haven't looked at uh, are the stories behind this component. And I just defined three stories. One where I, I, I specify an actual jump value and it is an enter. Another one where I don't specify any jump value, in which case the default value kicks in. And the third story, I tried to provide a jump prop which isn't an integer at all uh, so just you know, we'll just have a quick look at the stories so here we go so this looks like this story is where I don't give it, you can see here, I, I'm not actually giving it a jump uh, prop at all. So based on my component implementation, it should default to two. In this story, I'm specifying uh, a meaningful jump prop, I'm giving it the value three. And in this story, I'm passing in the string high as a jump and again, uh, that hopefully now is going to be caught by my uh, code that I just showed you there, which tries to check that the prop type is of a meaningful type rather than value. Now, there is actually one error in the, in the code that I've given you, which is, um, uh, sorry, just to explain here, right, what, what I'm doing here is, uh, th this allows me to control what appears in, on the left-hand side of storybook. Um, like if I put, so let's just look at the three stories. So here are my three stories here. The actual text that appears here, you can uh, change that or control that by using uh, what I've, by using this, this ID here. Uh, it just means that I could actually have, you know, I could have a space in the story name. So if I just change it to default case, let's say. You know, that's how it actually uh, appears here. So it just gives you a little bit more control over it. Uh, the error though is, the error is, where's the error again? Oh yeah, that should be exceptional. Exceptional here refers to that there. Normal here refers to normal there. Basic here refers to basic there. And so if I save that. Okay, now these are my three stories. Did I make an error? Did I make an error? 
don't think so. Why isn't that working? Can anybody smut the error that I made? Let's do this. Okay, now fix, need to fix this. Okay, right, picking up the story, the default story. The default story is where I don't specify any prop at all. And it looks like it's picking up two and it's picking up two as being my jump because in my components, I said, this is going a little bit slower than I expected. I said, that the default for jump should be two. So that seems to be working okay. And this is working fine. The normal case, the normal story is where I give it something meaningful. And in my story, I gave a jump value of three, which is, seems to be reflected there. That's working fine. Now here's the one you wouldn't expect. Um, and I need to open up the developer tools to show you what happens. Uh, if I just do a complete refresh again, just to clean up stuff. If I click on, keeps disappearing in me. I click on exception. So that's the jump. Now you see here on the right where it's giving me a warning message. That warning message, if you read it, it's essentially telling you that you're, you're passed in uh, an invalid prop value type. And that error message is being generated as a result. It's, well, it's a warning message really, sorry, rather than an error. It's a warning message and it's generated as a result of as a result of uh, this little bit of syntax down here. It doesn't crash the component. In fact, if I start clicking the plus the increment button, what will happen is not what you expect. Okay. So it's actually performing string concatenation. And it just happens that because I'm just adding jump to count, the plus kind of operator works for strings as well. So in this particular case, it doesn't cause my component to crash, but in, in other cases it may. But the important thing is you're getting a warning message here from React telling you, you know, you need to look at how you're using the component and that's coming from the actual story. Right, so there's a lot going on there, even though it's a 101 example. And again, I'll just pause for a second to give you a chance for any questions. No, okay. Um, we know the browser is an event-driven environment that hasn't changed as a result of using React. All I'm telling you at the top of this uh, slide is that obviously React has to work in every type of browser. So it needs to be a cross browser. In other words, even though the individual browsers, the events that they 
that they generate behind the scenes, either as a result of the user interacting with the what's being displayed on the screen or uh, from other sources. There may be slight differences between the events that are generated and events are anything other than objects with key value pairs in them. But each browser may have slight differences in terms of the key value pairs uh, that go into an event object. Clearly React uh, tries to make it consistent across all browsers. So what, what React presents to you as a developer is an event object that is cross-browser. Now that the technical name that it gave the event is this uh, synthetic event, which believe me, you will never have cause to delve into it, but I'm just making you aware of it. What is kind of important to, to know is that the names of the various events slightly changed uh, when you're using, when you're doing React development as opposed to doing native development. By native development, I mean, if we were doing, just using the DOM API, which we played around with very briefly there two weeks ago, uh, the native events are all kind of all lowercase, whereas the corresponding React event name are kind of this camel case. So there's a capital C there as opposed to a lower KC there and so on for the other examples. And if you want to get the full list of events, you can go to that URL there. So that's just, uh, that slide is really for information purposes. So now we know that, uh, for example, in the context of our little counter component, this is kind of the, the sequence in which things happen. The user clicks on the button because that button is linked to an event handler well, the event handler executes. That would all that was always the case, even when we were doing native development. But inside in the event handler, it changes uh, the state variable. Uh, the event handlers don't always have to do that, but in our case, it, in our illustration, it did. And because it changed the state a state variable, then this is what happens: the component function re-executes or re-renders. And it's really, this is what allows the component to be somehow dynamic because the component maybe computes the JSX that it wants to return. Uh, and if and the computation may be based on the new value of the state variable, which was in our case. So that's this notion of component state, and it's going to be a theme right throughout this module. So you do need to make sure you're comfortable with the fundamentals of it. The next thing I want to talk about is data flow within a React app. So there's a couple of messages now that I want to get across from this slide here. I've already told you that a React app is always, always going to be a hierarchy of components. That's the first thing I'm uh, re-emphasizing here. So it looks like in this uh, fictitious app that I have, I've got a component at the top of my hierarchy. It has two children. This child has one, uh, this component has one child. This component has two children. Now, what do I mean by this relationship here though? Um, what I mean by it is, it's got nothing to do with inheritance. Uh, what I mean by it is, if you looked inside the, this component's code, and you looked at the JSX that it returns, then within that JSX, it's going to have a reference to this component and this component. That's what the relationship means in this particular diagram. Similarly here, if you looked at the code for this component and you looked at the JSX that it returns, uh, it may include normal HTML, but within that HTML, it's going to include a reference to this component. That's the first thing. Now, the important message though in terms of data flow is based on the heading here. In React, data flows in one direction only between components, and that's in a downward direction. And we kind of already know this, okay? So what I'm saying is that this component can pass data down to its two children. And of course it does that via props. So props only go downward in this diagram, uh, and hence data only flows downward in your component hierarchy. That's the same all the way through. 
The next thing I want to highlight is I've got two different types of boxes or two different types of co components, it seems. And the boxes that are colored are stateful components. We now know what that means. So this seems to have, would have at least one, if not more state variables declared within it. Whereas the white boxes are stateless. They don't have any state variables. In the majority of applications, in fact, in all applications that React applications that you will ever develop, what you will find is that the majority of components will be stateless, these white boxes. A small minority will be stateful, the colored boxes. Let's not worry about how we come up with a design uh, that finishes up in that way. I'll talk about that at a later lecture but take it from me at this stage that that is always the case. The, uh, the minority of components will be stateful. Now, what we know is that when a stateful component changes its state, then we said that that component re-renders, it re-executes. But of course, if that component has children, then they also re-render or re-execute. And if this component re-executes or re-renders, then each child will re-render. Similarly, when this one re-renders, its two children will re-render. What that means is that, for example, in this application, when this component, uh, in, when one of its state variable changes, typically as a result of the user interacting with what's being displayed on the page, then this component re-renders, and every other component re-renders as well uh, in, in the order in which they appear on kind of in the diagram from the top down. That may seem inefficient, but React can improve the efficiency and performance and make decisions as to what it should and should not uh, re-render. You can help it as well in terms of certain things that you put into your code. We won't actually get to look at that. It's not that important. It's not a fundamental, uh, but there are ways of improving it. But for now, uh, what's important to realize is that when a stateful component re-renders as a result of one of its state variable changes, then its children also will re-render and any children that the children have will re-render, et cetera, et cetera. And if we take this component here, because it's also stateful, if it's one of its state variable changes, it re-renders as before, but only this one is going to re-render as a result of that. Nothing above this component is going to re-render. So it's, it's from the stateful component downwards that, that the re-rendering uh, kind of sequence happens. Um, now, the other thing we you can kind of get from this diagram, from this, uh, hierarchy here is that kind of what we're saying is that let's supposing this this displays this entire hierarchy displays something on the screen each component is contributing something to what has been displayed on the screen the stateful and the stateless they're all contributing something that is being displayed on the page it's quite possible that uh, when let's say this component when one of its state variable changes and it re-renders, uh, as part of the re-rendering execution, it may actually decide that I'm not going to uh, display this component at all. I'm going to leave this component out of the re-rendering process. And so if it's left, sorry, uh, if it's left out, then of course its children are left out. So you know, as the user interacts with this app, uh, maybe this small subset of components here become inactive. Uh, and so whatever they contribute to what's being displayed on the screen now disappears from the screen. Later on, maybe the user interacts again and that interaction causes this component uh, to re-render. And maybe on that re-rendering, it brings these back into the picture. So whatever they contribute to what's being displayed on the screen now reappears again. And this idea of components being kind of active and inactive, 
Uh, what we say is that the components mount and unmount from the current active hierarchy. So when this component re-renders and it decides I'm not going to cause this one to re-render, then what we would say is this component is unmounted from the hierarchy. And if it's unmounted, then clearly these two are unmounted as well. Uh, as I was saying, maybe later on the user interacts, there's some more interaction with the page and that interaction causes this component to re-render again. And on this re-rendering, it decides to bring this component back into the picture. So we would say that this component here remounts onto the hierarchy and subsequently its children. So over time, as the user is interacting with an app, components in the hierarchy may unmount and remount many times just based on the user interaction. That's all kind of typical React um, component behavior. Now on this slide, I'm just kind of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, repeating what I've been talking to there a few moments ago, so I'm not going to talk over this slide. You can uh, read it yourself. Uh, just to go back to one point, I'm saying that React follows this unidirectional data flow, which is that data can only flow in a downward direction in my hierarchy. That wasn't always the case. Other single page app frameworks supported what was referred to as two-way data binding, which as its kind of name suggested, data could flow in both directions. What it actually meant was that frameworks that followed two-way data binding, uh, you could do your initial development much quicker initially, but once you started hitting uh, runtime issues, it became more difficult to debug them uh, because now you know things are changing from more than one direction. As opposed to with React, which only supports unidirectional data flow, initially it can be quite a difficult thing to, because it does kind of constrain you in a certain way in, in terms of your development. So your initial um, development progress might be a little bit slower because you're kind of hampered that by this unidirection idea. But the upside of it is when you start hitting runtime errors and you have to do some debugging, it becomes a little bit easier to debug because you, you're, you're now, you, 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 you know that data is only flowing in a certain direction. That's a bit vague now, admittedly, but to take it from me, if you read any blogs contrasting unidirectional data flow versus two-way data bounding, they will all say that. So the long shot is that unidirectional data flow is a better model. And it was one of these um, uh, design decisions that the React team made at the very beginning of the React framework, because by far and away, the norm was this two-way data binding approach uh, when React came out initially. Right, we'll come back to data flow later on. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about, and as usual, falling behind in time, but I'll just keep going, is um, this topic of hooks. Hooks were something that were introduced to React, as I'm saying there, only in February of 2019. Now, if you remember, React first came out around 2010, I think, or sorry, maybe 2013, actually. So there were quite a number of uh, early releases of the React framework, which didn't have this hooks feature at all, um, but uh, now it's really, it's kind of the norm. So it, it wasn't always part of, of the framework. And what are these React hooks? Well, we've actually seen one already, which was the use state function, but to give you a kind of a more formal definition, I'm saying a React hook is simply a function uh, some of them, uh, there are many React hooks, as we see. Some of them are higher order functions, but essentially a Re React hook is a function. And number two there is it's a function for manipulating a component's state and managing its life cycle. So uh, manipulating a component state, well, we've seen that already. Uh, managing the life cycle, we'll come on to that. The third point there, I'm only including it for completeness 
because I said to you there a moment ago that React hooks were only introduced in February of 2019 in the evolution of the framework. Uh, but what, uh, but this idea of having state associated with a component and this notion of a component having a life cycle, they were always part of the React framework and always part of uh, React components. But uh, so we, we did still need to be able to manipulate state and manipulate lifecycle. And just the way we did it prior to 2019 meant that we had to implement our components as JavaScript classes. We know now that we implement component as functions. But prior to 2019, we had to implement them as JavaScript classes. And we had to inherit our component class had to inherit from a super class. And that super class had certain methods that we had to override in our component implementation. So that's so these uh, super class methods that you had to override. It was that's how you manipulated state and lifecycle back then. So that's just by the way. So the important points are one or two and one and two here. So there's a whole suite of these hook functions that come with the React framework, and there are third party ones as well. So we've already seen the use state one. By far and away, the second most popular one, our most commonly used one, is use effect. And then there are others as well. We will come across, I'd say, about four hooks, maybe, uh, but there are many more. There are some rules in terms of the usage of these hook functions. Number one, you can only call them, I'm saying, from the top level of a component. What I really mean by that is you can't call a hook function from, let's say, within a for loop or within the body of an if statement. If you try to do that, then React will throw back a warning to you in the uh, developer tools console saying, uh, in fact, it's even more serious than that. It'll, it'll crash your application. Uh, so it just won't allow you to do it. We needn't go into why you can't do that. It's got to do with how these hook functions are implemented internally. So uh, we just have to accept it that uh, we, we can't invoke them other than at the top level of a component. And that's about it, really. That's, that's the only rule or constraint in terms of using these hooks. Now, um, the second hook that I want to look at, um, I just started today anyway, even though I obviously have to dig into it the next day, is the use effect hook. And it is a hook, as its name hints at, it is a hook that you would use if you want your component to perform what I'm calling side effects. I mentioned side effects a while back, but you may not remember. Uh, it's a it, side effect is a, a, a general kind of programming idea. A side effect is when a function wants to access or influence something outside of its own scope. Now, and again, as I say, that's a general programming idea. You could have it, uh, you, you could talk about side effects in terms of methods associated with a Java class. And it would be if the method tried to access something outside of its own method implementation or tried to change something outside of its own method implementation, we would refer to those as side effects. Now, in the context of a React component, what constitutes side effects? Well, by far and away, this is the most common side effect that a component may wish to have. If a component wants to fetch data from a web API, clearly the web API is outside of the component scope. How do we implement that fetching of data? And the answer is we would need to use the use effect hook to do it. We know how to call an API that's remote from us. We use the, uh, coincidentally, the fetch function, but you can just, you cannot just stick a fetch function implementation inside in the middle of your component implementation. That isn't going to work. You've got to essentially wrap it inside this use effect hook function. Another example would be if a component wants to subscribe to a browser event I'm seeing here, uh, 
Now, by browser event here, I'm not talking about browser events associated with the user interacting with the browser, uh, interacting with a page as such. A good example of a browser event might be supposing uh, we try and resize the browser, um, the uh, the browser tab itself. Maybe we want a component of the components to change what they display as a result of resizing uh, the the browser uh, outline itself, the size of the browser itself. Um, but but this is this is the one that we will see uh, most common in terms of side effects. So the uh, the use effect hook of the use effect function it is a higher order function because what it expects are two arguments. It expects a callback, and it's inside in the callback. That's where you put the code that is performing the side effect. So, for example, if you've got a component that needs to talk to a web API, then the code that makes the API invocation is coded inside in this callback. The dependency array, uh, we'll come to talk about a little bit later on as to what the impact of that is. Okay, I'm conscious of time, uh, and as usual, I'm in the middle of something, so that's all. I'll have to pick up the story from this slide on Wednesday with you. I'm not giving you much time for asking questions in this lecture. What I'm finding is that people are asking lots of questions in the labs, which is great. Uh, so maybe I'll just use the lectures to bomb through the slides and explain the ideas and the concepts to you. And then in the labs, you can come back to me with questions um, because you'll see, obviously we're gonna be using this use effect hook in the labs, not in this week's lab, in next week's lab. So, right, I'm going to leave it at that.